morning, everybody. Uh, this is a joint meeting of House Appropriations and House Ways and Means, Friday, April 3rd. And the subject is the uh, education fund and the challenges in financing our schools um, in the current economic environment. Um, I really appreciate people's willingness to do this meeting jointly. And um, what I, uh, one observation I would make as we start is that our committee, um, we have uh, a limited number of tools. Um, they're pretty powerful, they're revenue and taxes. Um, but when um, people can't pay taxes, we kind of, um, the tools that we normally have really uh, don't work that effectively. And so when we look at financing our schools, which is a state responsibility, it's going to be something that's going to require um, uh, thinking on the part of, of many people and um, these two committees are, and the education committee, which we met with jointly yesterday are probably the three that are gonna be most involved. So I really appreciate um, having uh, the opportunity to share uh, information and um, get everybody thinking um, on the same page. So Kitty, do you wanna say a word sure. or two and then we'll yes. start? Sure, thank you, Janet. And, um, and, and we really, uh, I'm, we're going to learn to appreciate the challenges that you're under because of the numbers that we will hear impacting the education fund, but also for the Ways and Means Committee. Janet and I, when we met, we thought it was important that we understand your challenges and, and you understand the challenges uh, within the general fund and uh, not being able to even start an FY21 budget because our general, our um, adopted um, official forecast no longer means anything uh, with the major disruptions with the virus. And we have to do another budget adjustment. Uh, we'll learn these numbers um, as a group again when, when Steve is on uh, because the current year is way out of whack too. And we have significant problems to close up the current year. And who knows where we're going to end up um, the FY21 budget. So the challenges are all around and the, and the more we can all be on the same page and work as a team, I, I think we'll go move through, um, I don't know if faster, but more wisely. And I just did wanna say, George, you're, you're the one person that's in the hospitals daily and, and thank you for what you're doing and stay safe. We need you and, and the people at the hospital need you. Yeah. Um, so, um, we're starting with Graham. We're starting with Graham. Yeah, we have Graham, Mark, and uh, Steve Klein are going to be our three witnesses. So, and Kitty and I will call on people as we go along. So, just bear with us in terms of recognizing you if you have questions. So, we'll try to take turns from uh, ways and means to appropriations. Um, I know. I think we'll just. I don't know. Just we'll we'll see how okay. goes. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Graham. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Graham Campbell from the Joint Fiscal Office, and um, I'm going to present the document that Sorsha or Teresa has on the screen right now. And um, this is pretty much just an overview of the uh, new revenue estimates we have from Tom Cavett. Um, and I'll sort of go over this as sort of a big overview. And I think Steve and Mark will dive deeper down into the, the two various funds, um, the general fund, the transportation fund, and the, Mark will do the education fund. Um, as, again, as I did this before, um, I caveat this by saying that all these numbers are for fiscal year 20. Um, these, we don't even look at fiscal year 21 yet. And all of these are likely to change and be updated. And I'll give you a sense of how much these have changed since um, last week when I presented them um, and what we received from Tom Cavett. But um, essentially I have a, uh, today a little bit of, a little bit of good news and um, a, a fairly, fairly large piece of bad news um, from the new revenue estimates. So looking at this table here, um, the updated revenue estimates across all three funds are projecting right now. Um, so this is for all three funds that we um, are going to um, see potential revenue impacts on the negative side of about $387 million um, and about $192 million of that will be from what I'm calling economic impacts. So a slowdown in activity, uh, $196 million of it will come from um, 
tax deferrals or shifts from fiscal year um, 20 into 21. And so that's the headline number. That's modestly better than what it was on March 25th, that number, instead of $387 million that it was that it is now was about $415 million. Um, so it's a little bit better. Um, and most of that is coming in the general fund, uh, the, 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 the good news rather. So looking at the general fund, um, Tom Cabet and Jeff Carr are currently forecasting that fiscal year 20 will be subject to negative revenue impacts of about $202 million. Um, and about 62 million of that will be from uh, the slowdown in activity. And most of that $62 million is coming from um, lower personal income tax revenue, lower corporate income tax revenue, and then a little bit on the property transfer tax as well. And then about 140 million of that is coming from the income tax def um, delays the administration has put in place. Um, so I think it was last week, I'm losing track of time because everything's moving so quickly, but I think it was last week that the administration delayed the filing and payment dates for personal and corporate income taxes from April 15th to July 15th, which is obviously July 15th is a different fiscal year. And so those numbers in the general fund, the 202 that you see there is slightly better. Um, in, on March 25th, that number was about $230 million to the down. Um, and the reason why this is a little bit better is because um, Tom and Jeff have um, changed their estimates on refunding. So some of the data that we ha have received to show that um, because of the income tax delays um, by the administration, um, people are delaying their payments, but it also appears though some people are delaying their refunds as well. So a lot of people when they file their income tax return don't necessarily know whether they have a refund or a payment due. And so the fact that we ha are paying out less refunds at the moment kind of um, gives us a, a better picture um, right now for fiscal 20. Um, should I pause here on the general fund or should I just move through all the funds and then we can take questions afterward? I don't know what's the best. I think move through and then we'll take questions at the end. Sure. Okay, so the next fund to look at is the transportation fund. Right now we're looking at revenue, negative revenue implications of about $45 million. And almost all of that is um, from the slowdown in activity related to um, the various consumption taxes and also the deferral of some of the motor vehicle fees <clears throat> um, that the administration issued on March 17th. So of the 42 million, about 30-ish um, million of it comes from lower motor vehicle purchase and use taxes and gasoline taxes. Another about 12, 13 million dollars um, is from lower motor vehicle uh, fees. Um, and that number um, on March 25th, instead of 45 million was um, about 36 million. So the transportation fund has been um, has seen a sort of a negative downgrade in the estimate um, since March 25th. And then the, the, um, the bigger piece of bad news is happening in the education fund relative to what we, we had on March 25th. Um, the education fund at, at this moment um, is projected to see negative revenue impacts totaling about $142 million. Um, and the biggest change in this forecast is coming in the, the economic impact side. So that's projected to be about $89 million to the down and tax deferrals, um, which are related to the administration's payment or delay of payment date for the sales and use tax and the meals and rooms tax, um, total about $53 million. Um, to give you a perspective of how much this has changed, on March 25th, the education fund, um, the economic impacts of this. So that $89 million number um, that you see in this table was about um, just about 43, $44 million. So um, the economists have downgraded the sales and use tax mostly by about double. Um, and so um, it's, it's quite a more, um, difficult situation in the education fund than what we were previously looking at. Um, 
even 24 hours ago. Um, and I'll let Mark sort of get into um, all the issues um, related to that. And so, um, and a lot of these, and I'll discuss this a little further, but on the tax deferral side, particularly on the education fund side, there's a lot of risk in that number in the $53 million number that you see here, because um, what the administration has done is deferred the payment, the, the March and April payments for the sales and use tax and the meals and rooms tax. Um, and all and three payments will be needed to be made um, in May. And so the question is if businesses are using the, the tax payment money to make payroll or to make expenses, it's unclear at this point in time whether they'll, have, if, if business doesn't start up between now and May, um, whether they'll have even the money to make the May payment. Um, and so right now there is some sort of um, like what we call loss being um, attributed in the meals and rooms tax because of this, but not a lot. Um, and so the risk on that um, remains relatively high. And so um, before I go into some of the additional revenue issue questions that we're thinking about going forward, does anyone have any questions on just straight numbers here? Uh, I don't see anybody who's raised a hand, but we'll pause for a second. Oh, it looks like you can go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to quickly remind the committee, the committees um, about some of the income, the, the, the tax deferrals rather. Um, that have occurred that are creating a bunch of revenue shifts from fiscal year 20 to 21. And the first big one in the general fund um, is the shift to the personal and corporate income tax um, filing and payment deadline, moving from April 15th to July um, 15th. This includes any estimate, quarterly estimated payment dates on April 15th, but there's been no guidance issued about the June 15th estimated payment date. Um, and so that's what's causing that approximately $140 million in the general fund to be shifted from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21. At the same time as the um, personal and corporate income tax delay, um, the administration announced a delay of filing requirements for the homestead declaration and household income forms, which are usually um, required by April 15th, um, but those have been pushed to July 15th as well. Um, and I'll let Mark go into potentially some of the issues there. The third is the filing and payment deadlines for the March and April payments of the meals and rooms and sales and use taxes have now been pushed to May 25th. And so the way that those payments work in the tax world is that um, for any given payment in a month, it represents the activity and the sales that you made in the month before. So if you delay the March and April payments, of the meals and rooms and sales and use tax. What's that rep what that rep is representing is the activity and sales made for February and March. And then finally, the administration on March 17th issued a 90 day extension for um, renewals for motor vehicle fees. And then obviously will affect the, affects the transportation fund. <clears throat> and so these are just you know, three major revenue issues going forward for, for both committees. But the, the obvious one is how do we make up revenue shortfalls and not just the general fund, but all three funds at this point. Um, and I think that the emphasis you know, in this presentation as it was before is now on more so on the, also on the education fund. Um, education fund was not nearly as, um, big of an issue um, last week as it is right now. So we have our fiscal year 20 revenue shortfalls in all three funds at the moment. So um, how do we make up those shortfalls? The second bullet point here is on some of these trust tax deferrals, um, there's significant risk. These, like I said, these businesses may not be able to pay in May if they are using the money from the, the, the tax deferral to make payment or to make expenses in March. And so is it possible that these deferrals um, on the trust taxes end up pushing beyond May? And that is um, quite a significant risk to the education fund, but also to the general fund because the general fund um, 
also collect the meals and rooms tax is an important part of the general fund. Um, and then Mark will go into this a little bit more, but household income form being delayed to July 15th, um, how, how exactly that is going to work with towns and how they're going to get property tax credits on bills um, for towns that have early billing or for uh, bills that come out in, in July, another question. And so all these revenue estimates also haven't exactly looked completely at also a lot of the direct app, uh, appropriations that come into the general fund. And so just uh, thinking off the top of my head, the property transfer tax, um, Tom has made an estimate for that, but obviously um, the, the revenues that come into the general fund aren't necessarily tied directly to the statutory language um, on that. There's direct apps. And so how will those get affected? There's also other special funds. So thinking a little bit off the top of my head, the clean water fund benefits from the, the meals and rooms tax, and that is currently going to be downgraded. So there's other funds here that we, we haven't even begun to look at yet. And so um, the third large bullet point here is that the problem is we're I don't want to say we're flying blind, but the revenue data that we have is, is delayed. And so we, it's difficult for, I think, Tom and Jeff to um, uh, make as accurate forecasts as they possibly could under normal circumstances. And so the March revenue reports come in at the beginning of the succeeding of, of, the April, of April. So we have some preliminary March revenues, but the problem is most of those revenues reflect activity that happened in February. Um, and so, you know, we, we were anxious to see whether some of the tax, the trust tax deferrals were already starting to show up in March. And it looks like a little bit um, based upon what we had from April 2nd, um, that meals and rooms missed its March target by about 30% and sales and use missed it by about 2.3%. But I don't think and Tom and Jeff don't think that this is anywhere near the potential impact we will see come next month. And so we have a little bit of data, but um, a lot of the, the modeling that Tom and Jeff are doing is are basically are based upon um, bits of information from industry groups, also looking at um, epidemiological models. And so um, that's why a lot of these revenue um, estimates change so much from week to week um, with with any bit of information they're able to revise these numbers. And then the final bullet point I'll wrap up here is we're still only talking about fiscal year 20 here with this, these tables and these issues. Um, we still have been fiscal year 21 upcoming and um, is expected that those revenues will be uh, downgraded um, over what they were forecasted in January quite a bit as well. So I'm um, sorry to, to break mostly bad news, but uh, at this point, I guess I'll Pass along to Steve and Mark, and hopefully they can put some oh. more flesh on the bone here. Um, there are a couple of people with questions, uh, Diane and then Scott. Um, th thank you, Janet. Um, I'm not too sure if, you, if Graham, if you're the source, but I'm wondering if the state is getting any, you know, upstream delays in our in our relief of paying some of our debt service, like our 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 bonding and and things that we have to pay. Are we getting sort of a 90 day delay or a year look? I don't know if you're the person. I, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that question. I'd probably defer that one to Steve. Okay, thank you. Uh, Scott. Hey Graham, um, just curious um, with these shortfalls and we really don't know exactly what they're gonna be and we really don't know what, when the economy is gonna restart um, has anybody had any conversations with the treasurer's office about what the impacts of borrowing might be? Um, again, I'm going to defer that one to Steve. I think he's had some conversations and I think he would probably be the best person to answer what some of the options there might be um, going forward. Okay, thank you. Yep. Good. Um, unless there's other questions for Graham, let's move to Mark um, now. Hey, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, okay. so um, for those who have seen this before um, in previous presentations, buckle up, it's a little bit different right now. <laughs> um, I can see that, um, can everybody see the education fund outlook yep. um, on the screen? Okay, 
So I think the easiest way to do this is to show you where we were or where we thought we were um, prior to the um, COVID-19 um, stay-at-home orders taking place and then move to the um, what's labeled the COVID-19 um, forecast that's been updated as of last night. So um, in terms of FY20, um, if uh, Teresa or whoever's controlling the screen, could you go down to the bottom of the page? Okay, so um, prior to this um, COVID-19 um, issue arising, the education fund was actually in pretty good shape um, financially. If you look on line 26, you can see that we assumed that we had a full um, stabilization reserve of $36.4 million. That was a full 5% reserve as is required by statute. And on top of that, we were anticipating um, closing the fiscal year with a $12.9 million surplus. You can see that number um, down on line 30. So we were looking at um, going into um, FY21 at that point in pretty good shape. Uh, now, moving on to after the revised um, outlook for 2020, uh, Teresa, can you go back up to the top of the page? Um, and a little bit down just so we can see sources completely. Thank you. Okay, so um, in terms of the sources now, um, in the previous um, balance sheets we were looking at, we sort of took a midpoint, a 35 to $45 million shortfall in consumption taxes, and just had a line in um, sources that um, showed you how that would roll through. So we have more information now. We have an update from Tom Cavett um, as of last night. I put this in, these in about five o'clock last night and I can just show you what's going on here. Um, first of all, the consumption taxes that are dedicated to the education fund show up on lines three, four, and five. Those are the sales and use tax, the purchase and use tax, and the meals and rooms tax. The biggest impact, obviously, sales tax because 100% of the sales tax is dedicated to the Ed Fund. For purchase and use and uh, meals and rooms tax, they're splinter taxes, so the Ed, Ed Fund gets a portion of them, so it doesn't take the full brunt of any downturn. Uh, one other bit of information that we did not have yesterday is the lottery transfer is also now projected to go down significantly from where it was last year, dropping from 29.2 to $22.9 million. So all told, the difference there from the uh, education fund outlook that we were looking at as late as yesterday um, is another $48.7 million downgrade. So to see what that does to the education fund, Teresa, if you can uh, scroll down to the bottom of the sheet again. First of all, uh, hold on there. First of all, you can see we have not made any changes to uses. So that's an assumption, assuming no changes in budgeted education uses, that's on line 20. But if you go to line 21, you can see that the operating deficit we were expecting has grown from about 15 million up to 104. And that has required um, us to, to, first of all, use all of the surplus we were anticipating on line 30, that 12.9, all of the uh, monies that we were assuming were gonna be available in the stabilization reserve, that $36.4 million. Roll that all in, and right now we're looking at a $39.5 million deficit in FY20. This is the current year. Basically, the education fund is insolvent at this point. Um, we're short almost $40 million to get through the current year. This isn't even looking forward to FY21. This is all just current year. But to make that even worse, these numbers do not take into account any of the deferrals um, that Graham went over. This just assumes um, the, uh, you know, I don't have a sheet in front of me, but it assumes the loss that we're aware of. It doesn't assume that, um, it assumes that we're gonna collect 100% of the consumption taxes that have been deferred until May. And I think that it's an open question as to whether we'll be able to actually collect all that money and it may also present some kind of a cash flow problem because the final payment for this school year um, is uh, April 30th. And the payments that are coming in, the deferred payments that they come, even if they come in, 100% um, of them, they could be coming in after 
at, well, they will be coming in after the 30th, I think. And um, the other thing I um, want to mention, and we've sort of underplayed it in the previous presentations because um, it didn't seem like um, situations were quite so dire, but we assumed that all of the education property tax money from non-homestead and homestead taxpayers was going to be paid into the education fund in a timely fashion. Okay, that means 100% of the education tax money that we were expecting to collect for this fiscal year on this balance sheet, we've also assumed that we're all gonna collect, we're gonna collect all that money. So we took a look at this a little bit earlier and um, right now, we think that there's about $132 million in uncollected education property tax money still out there. In other words, um, municipalities have yet to raise all of the money that they need to collect. Um, that's going to create, if, if municipalities aren't able to collect that money, that's going to create a worse outlook for, 20, for 2020. And um, it's going to be a problem for schools because that, that money, if municipalities aren't able to collect it, municipalities and the education fund both make payments to school districts. So school districts are going to be left holding the bag. We're not able to collect the full amount of money. So um, I can stop there. That's FY 2020. Um, and I can talk a little bit about the issues that Ways and Means is facing looking forward to FY 21. But should I wait to pause there? And are there any questions? Mark, I, I just want to, um, uh, just a clarifying uh, question. The, you talked about the April payment. That's what the state pays the um, school districts, and, but it's the municipalities that have to collect the education tax and send it to the state, right? So there's a- Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually complicated because the way yep. it works is the municipalities collect um, the education property tax as an agent for the state. They take that money after they've collected it, put it in the bank, and they hold that money until the agency of education directs them to send it to towns on uh, one third of the amount in, on three dates during the year. The last one is April 30th, and that is still outstanding. Districts that are able to raise more um, than they spend, and that's a lot of non-homestead property tax plus some homestead tax from places, goes into the education fund and that money goes out. It's roughly 50-50. It's a little bit more coming out of the ed fund, but almost half of the money goes directly from the municipalities to the school district. If the municipalities are unable to collect those funds because people are out of work, businesses are closed or whatever, then it's gonna create a cash flow problem for the schools um, in order to stay open or, or continue to make payments for the rest of the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, Chip has a question. Uh, Mark, Mark. Um, so the 132 million that's uncollected is that that, that those payments haven't been uh, that those taxes aren't due yet, or they they didn't haven't been able to collect them even though they're due. No, they're, they're, they're taxes that are not due yet. Um, you know, we have a decentralized education property tax collection system. It basically yeah. piggybacks on the municipal system. Um, we think that there were our 82 towns or 82 municipalities that still have outstanding liabilities of up to 132 million. And the biggest concern is that there are um, 70 municipalities that have fully one half of the education tax money mm -hmm. that's owed still outstanding. And that's because they make, they bill twice a year. Yeah. One of those bills has not, has not been come due yet and the money hasn't been remitted. Um, Mike, I wasn't very concerned about this initially, um, but given the additional information we've received from Tom Covette and how drastically the consumption taxes have fallen, um, it makes me wonder whether there's going to be spillover and people are not going to be able to pay these taxes in a timely fashion. So what I thought was not an FY 2020 issue, but probably a 21 issue may also be an issue this year. Uh, Thank you. If that answers the question, I have one, one, one good piece of good news, and that is the um, federal stimulus bill that was passed on the 27th will provide um, some assistance to us. Um, it will amount to a Vermont allocation of the um, total amount that was appropriated at the federal level is a little over $30 million. Um, 
not enough to close the, the deficit we've just opened, part one. Part two is that that money goes to the agency of education and then directly out to the supervisory unions for distribution to the school districts. That means that money is gonna entirely bypass the education fund. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's an issue that's out there. Um, it, it doesn't really help us with this problem of a, of a deficit in the fund right now. There's also four and a half million dollars that um, is intended for um, education fund relief in the same package. That money goes to the governor. He has the discretion as to how it's allocated, but it has to be spread out over um, K through 12, higher ed, and any other education um, related um, institutions. And it can cover things like childcare and uh, daycare and a whole bunch of other things. So I don't know how much of that $4.5 million will be helpful here. Yeah, uh, Scott so. has a question. Hey, Mark. Um, question as far as the, um, this, this issue of the municipalities not being able to pay the school districts and or the education fund. Um, mm -hmm. Did we run into something similar to this in 2008 and 9 with the Great Recession? Um, I, I don't remember municipalities being short. We had, we had a similar situation with um, the federal aid uh, because it, it also went directly to school districts. So at that time, we reduced the general fund transfer um, to the education fund by the same amount and dealt with the education fund issue that way. Um, in terms of actual um, payments from the municipalities to the districts, I don't remember any um, problem um, arising um, at that time. Okay. Um, I know that on an annual basis, or maybe, I don't know, I'm sure we have municipalities because of local circumstances on the ground. They mm -hmm. may run into this problem uh, from time to time, probably on a just a very few basis for whatever reason. Um, yep. How do they usually rectify that problem? I think they usually go out and uh, they um, do short-term borrowing. Okay. And not borrowing from the education fund, it's borrowing from the local right. bank. Oh. Um, I spoke to Michael Gaughan about that, and that's an issue that we're working on. But at least right now, it appears that some of the provisions in the federal stimulus bill are designed to prop up the municipal bond and short-term borrowing markets. So districts may be able to go out and do that, but you know that'll add that'll add an additional cost. Right. Um, but they right. but they may be able to get through FY 2020 by doing that. That's still, that's going to leave FY21. All these things that we're doing to get through FY2020 are just going to make things worse next year. Yeah, I know. That money's got to come from somewhere, though. It'd be really nice to know if that municipal bond bank is functioning properly. Right. Um, so um, that's all. So with that, I can go on and talk a little bit about FY21 if you're interested. Mark, in I have a quick question regarding the current year. We're starting with a 40, we have a $40 million shortfall we need to fill. Of the federal education stimulus dollars coming in, that thirty million, it goes directly to schools, but it it has to go against that forty million dollar problem, doesn't it? Isn't it a record keeping problem, or are those? I, I, it, I, it isn't. I, I, I don't. I don't know how to address it. We have a unique education finance system. When the when the federal federal government designs these allocations, I think they're assuming everybody's on a foundation formula where we send money out to, out to the districts. Mm -hmm. We have a much more integrated system. Um, and again, as I mentioned, when, when we had this problem back in 2010 and 2011, when we got $18.5 million each year for 2010 and 2011, that money also went directly to school districts. And we were able to work around that problem by reducing the general fund transfer by the same amount, the $18.5 million in each of 2010 and 2011. Now we no longer have a general fund transfer to the education fund. We have dedicated um, education revenue sources going in. So I, I'm not sure how, how this could be addressed. Um, another possibility is that this money is going to be coming into the state very late in the fiscal year. I mean, we, it, it, we have a month to apply for it. It was, it was approved on the 27th. There's a month to apply for it, which takes you to um, the 27th of the next month. And then um, there's another 30 days before the federal government has to pay that money out, which is going to put us late in May. So you, one possible use of this money would be to allow it to roll over into FY21 and allow districts to reduce their budgets by that amount of money then. And that would address the education fund question because 
the way the budgeting works, the school set a budget. From that budget, they subtract any categorical or other aid that they get from the federal, aid, federal government or the state. And the education payment line would be smaller. That's the number we base the education property taxes on. So that, that's one way to address this, given that it's coming later. I know Steve's been working on this issue, so after he goes, he may have better answers than that. Um, but that's, that's what I know about it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Peter. So Mark, on, under maintenance of effort for this, I've, I know that, uh, that we have to, the state of Vermont has to support school districts um, in an average amount provided in the three prior fiscal years. Have you determined what that average amount is for the past three fiscal years prior to the enactment uh, date of this act? No, I, I mentioned that was something we were going to have to watch, and I wasn't too worried about it with the $40 million downgrade. But with this $88 million downgrade, I have to go back and relook at it. I haven't, I haven't checked that yet. It's an issue that, that we need to look at. Um, when you figure that out, can you email all of us that information, please? I, I, I will. Um, Am I wrong to look at this and say that's the amount of, of uh, ed fund that we need to be able to uh, push out to the uh, to the school districts in order to meet the requirements of this act? Um, Whatever that 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 uh, MOE dollar amount is average. Yeah, I, I have I have to go back and read the language. I don't want to answer. Okay, off the, okay. Off the, that's fine. I, I, it's, it's a you. great question and I'll get back to you on it. And it's, it's, yeah, Thank you. it's important. Mark, uh, um, just a clarification. When I'm looking at the balance sheet, the 39.5 um, uh, deficit is um, over and above. That, that, I'm sorry, that leaves the stabilization reserve at zero. Is that right? Uh, well, there is, there is no stabilization reserve anymore, yes. And yeah. we have what we're carrying in that line is the $30.95 billion deficit. The, fund, so, the funds in the yeah. So, so to get the stabilization reserve up to its legal limit, which is three and a half, no, it's 5% now, um, would, would require more than the 39.5. Yeah, it would require another 38 million on top of that to get back right. up to the 5%. Yeah. So it's, so it's, it's just really, a, a, in order to comply with the statute anyway, there's a, a 70 million or so that we're missing. Okay. Now the, the, the really scary news is that it looks like going into FY21, um, the, no, the consumption tax um, revenue forecast is likely to be even more severe. And on top of that, any issues that we have in terms of collecting outstanding education property tax liability could be a problem as people who are unemployed, businesses shut, all the things that are going on along COVID-19 may lead to the inability, just simple inability to pay property taxes um, uh, in a timely manner next year. Um, that on top of the revenue, the uncertainties around the consumption tax revenue puts us in a position where we're really flying blind into FY21 right now. We do not have a reliable, reliable estimate in place for FY21 spending. So it's going to be very, very difficult um, to set property tax parameters for next year. As you all know, normally prior to the legislature adjourning, the property tax parameters for the yields and the non-homestead uh, property tax um, are set. And, um, you know, right now, you could pick a yield, you could pick rates, and we can tell you what the property tax implications are, but have no way of telling you what the, the bottom line on the education fund um, would look like. Um, another point is that voters have already gone out and voted during town meeting, and they approved about a $73 million increase in education for FY21. So although we don't we don't know what revenues are coming in, we do know what expenditures are looking like, at least under normal circumstances. Um, even if it were possible to reduce spending at this point, most spending, close to 80% of total spending, um, education spending is teacher and staff salaries and benefits. Um, I looked yesterday, um, districts normally have to issue RIFs that they're expecting significant problems in the following year and most of those deadlines under contract have already gone by and in any case you know layoff layoffs of teachers in the middle of a recession is, is not a good outcome but um, I looked at it as, as, as a, maybe a draconian possibility and it looks like it's 
our opportunity to do anything like that is largely um, gone by the boards. So, uh, um, so I see that Bob uh, Helm has a question. Um, and then uh, if you could talk afterwards about the budgets that have not been adopted, uh, that'd be good. But Bob, go ahead. Thank you, Teresa. I'll be quick, uh, Mark. <clears throat> so if, if this virus thing gets over here in the next couple of weeks, which I don't think it's going to, it's a mood issue. However, if it lumbers long until uh, September, October, there are going to be a, a, a great deal of people in a property tax payment bind. And I guess my question is, does the town have the, does the municipality have a, the ability to extend that indefinitely or is it only for like a year? Do you, do you know the answer to that? I, I, I don't know. I, I do know, however, that municipalities have, have the authority to abate only municipal property taxes, not education property taxes. And statewide, education property taxes account for about two-thirds of the total. On top of that, the municipalities, at least under current right. law, are required to remit that money on a timely basis to the state, or there's an 8% penalty that they have to pay. So if you think about it, municipalities, if they're unable to collect property tax revenues right now and get hit twice, they would lose the municipal tax money that they need to run, you know, police, fire, roads, those kind of things. But they would also right. be on the hook. They would also be on the hook for the amount of that they owe the state for the education property tax collections. So they're going to be in a in a real bind, a cash flow bind, um, if they're if significant. So this of, thing, okay. this this thing has the capabilities of continuing out not a year five years three years who knows how many how much and for how long but until the economy gets back in gear which we don't even know if that's going to happen um it, it they're, they're 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 going to be having troubles and aren't we going to pile up a whole lot of back payments on um, municipal taxes? Yeah, I, I think so. I, but I also think that we, we don't have a really good picture of that at this point. Um, Tom Cavett is currently right. working on epidemiological models so that they can try to get a guess of, as to how long and how deep any recession is going to be that relates from this. But that's um, way, way outside of my realm. I, I don't feel comfortable answering it, but um, it does not look good, no. Nope, thank you very much. I just thought I'd throw it by you. Appreciate it. Um, let me, so, uh, Diane has a question. Thank, thank you. So I've had communications from my community as well on this or the town, and um, it might be too early to ask, but I'm wondering if at some point we're gonna, are we going to have the intent of helping out towns with this cash flow problem either with you know, either with federal dollars or delays or um, an answer to this for them or with them? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I can tell you that the, the payments to the school districts in order to finish up the current fiscal year we're in would normally be paid by April 30th. Now, if that doesn't happen, they can go out, as I mentioned earlier, they can go out right. short tomorrow, but there is that short term, you know, problem. And other than the federal money um, that's rolling in right now, I don't know. I've heard that there may be a fourth stimulus package that yep. is specifically towards municipalities and state governments, but um, at this point, we don't know. So, um, and, I'll, and I'll just end with this. So later today, I've got a, a phone call with our city managers and others that are looking at that, that situation at the community level. So, and they mentioned the short-term borrowing. So would it be, Correct in my assumption to say to them that would be the avenue to go right now, or should they should I direct their question to somebody else within? When you say the way to go now, you mean short term borrowing? Correct. Um, that's that. Um, that I, I, a lot of districts do it anyways. This time of year, when they're closing out the yep. year, they may have a, they may have a property tax payment due after the April thirtieth date. So I think they're used to doing it. And as far as we know, the market for short term borrowing is still okay. So that would probably be the best way for them to address um, FY20. For FY20. FY20. Yeah. yeah. 
Mark, would you talk a little bit about the budgets that have not been adopted, which is a whole nother wrinkle to fiscal 20? Yeah, so, so there's, there's two categories of accounts that, haven't, uh, that have to vote still. Um, there were nine districts that voted down their budgets during the town meeting week, including South Burlington and Slate Valley, which are two large ones. And then there are a number of other districts, uh, I'm not sure the number five or more, that schedule their votes, like Essex, that schedule their votes after town meeting. They have not yet voted. Um, I know South Burlington that had a failed budget schedule the revote and they've now postponed that vote till later so i i don't know when um it'll be possible for those districts to pass budgets there are default just like for the yields there are defaults in current law that will allow districts to continue to operate even if they don't have budgets they can um, spend up to 89 percent of their fy 2020 budget and the commissioner can set their um, education tax rate at one dollar temporarily until um, other information comes in. So districts could continue to operate, but um, when when, and if um, they're going to be able to vote on their budgets, I don't know. Well, there's the practical problem of voting. And then there's also the problem about whether they can get budgets adopted uh, given the economic situation that we're in. Right, but they could, they could under current law, they could go back to I think 87% of their yeah. prior year budget. Right. Could yep. use that in order to stay operating, so it wouldn't be a complete shutdown. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, other... Go ahead. Sorry, you go ahead. Okay. So the the, the couple of other issues Graham Graham mentioned um, moving the income tax filing deadline from April fifteenth to July fifteenth also caught up the um, homestead declaration and the property tax um, credit claim forms. Um, I've spoken with the tax department. Um, I think they believe that they can live with um, the law as it stands because um, municipalities have some flexibility, as I understand it, in terms of uh, moving their first billing date. Um, I looked and I saw very few um, districts that bill in July. Most of them start after in August. And if districts were able to delay sending out bills until August 1st, they would likely have the information from the tax department that they need to provide bills that include the property tax credit um, and other information like that. Um, if a district decides to not delay until August 1st, they can go ahead and bill. They would just have to, under have to understand that they would have to issue a whole lot of corrected property tax bills later. But there are provisions in the law in place to deal with this as you know, inelegant as they are, but it looks like right now it doesn't require any legislative intervention um, to address that problem. And then uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is the uh, tax, property tax credit for taxpayers who experience significant COVID-19 related losses um, in income in the current calendar year. And I mentioned this because I, I, I'm expecting you'll hear from constituents that get hit by this, but the property tax adjustment that is going to show up on people's bills in 2020, the ones that they're going to, in 21, the ones that they're going to be getting for the next school year are going to be based on their household income in calendar year 2019. So any losses in income that they're going to face because of COVID-19 will fall into the current calendar year 2020, and they will not receive any adjustment for that until 2022. So get their money, but it's, it's spread out. They won't see any immediate resistance. And people who have lost their jobs and have no income you know, may be surprised that they're not gonna get assistance on their property tax bill this year. In terms of the 2022 impact, I was worried about a really big spike that year. And I think that there will be, but it will be offset to some extent because household income is defined broadly enough to include uninsurance um, benefits, and any other federal assistance that comes down um, as a result of the stimulus package that they've paid. So, uh, not good news. No, <laughs> it's not good news. Uh, <laughs> let me pause for a second and see if people have questions. I think Peter Fagan has a question. Um, he put his hand down. So, okay. Peter, do you want to jump in? He answered my question. Thank you. That's that's what I figured. I saw you. I saw you lower yeah. your hand here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if I could jump in, I can answer a question that you asked a couple of days ago. Oh, good. <laughs> I hadn't 
you on, and that is can how big a deficit can um, municipalities and school districts run? Um, school districts, um, as far as we can tell, there's no limit on the amount that they could run as a deficit. However, they have to pay that money back within the next three fiscal years. So it has to be added to their education spending. So while it would, you know, get them through this immediate problem in 2020, again, it's just pushing it out until um, 21. And there are requirements that they actually add that cost onto their education spending in the next fiscal year and raise that money um, to sort of to close that, that shortfall. Did you say three years they have to pay it off? Yeah, I, I, I think they can. Yeah, they can spread it out over three years if they want to. But Mark, one of the things that seems um, uh, pretty clear from what you've said is that whatever solutions we come up with for fiscal 20 are going to affect um, this, how we, uh, the problem that we have in fiscal 21. We can't separate yeah. the years. Um, no, I, I, at this point, we can't separate the years. I mean, we're, we're close to the close of the year anyways. We were, you know, we were coming right. towards the year, so. You know, even school districts have very little flexibility to reallocate money or do anything at this point. We're pretty much locked into where we were, so. Right, yeah. Uh, anything else anyone has um, for Mark? If not, I think we'll, we'll switch to Steve. Mark, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so Steve, we hope you have great news for the general fund after that delivery of information. <laughs> Are we getting Steve on here? We have you, Steve. Oh, uh, you know, Mark, while we're waiting for Steve, do you want to talk about, or maybe you already did, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund? Did you already go over that? Basically, that's the 30.1 million. Oh, I see Steve's here. Go, go ahead, Steve. Oh, no, I was just, uh, I'm, okay, sorry. I just am having an um, operator error here. Uh, That's fine. You go ahead. No, that doesn't really work. Okay. Um, why am I, it never happened before. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, Steve Klein, and I'll try to be uh, focused here. So, yeah, I was going to focus, I, I'm going to put up on the screen uh, a cash flow sheet in a minute just to talk about this. But I thought what I'd do is go, spend about a total of maybe 10 minutes going over context and then um, let's see, it says host says start video. Okay. Uh, and um, then uh, uh, go into the specifics of the ed fund. And first of all, that one of the things we're seeing with this change of the forecast is just that we're in an unfolding pandemic, resources are changing uh, constantly. And this, some of this, the, the house provisions heard last Wednesday, but um, what, and one of the things we'll, we'll talk about maybe later is the, um, the federal resources and just how their restrictions may change over time. Uh, we're seeing relief coming, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the timing, the big money, the 1.25 billion that's coming in is coming. We've been told that the uh, guidelines for its uh, use will be submitted to us the week of the 12th and the money should arrive on the 24th. Um, one of the things really interesting about this is they're actually sending us a check for 1.25 billion which raises um, all types of issues about where we put it, um, how, the, how it's put in different bank accounts. Um, there's rules about collateralization and the treasurer's trying to figure all that out. What it does do is it makes the importance of a provision that we hopefully will pass in the next bill out of the station um, called interfund borrowing. And what it is at the end of the year and in December, we have a, a, a authority for the treasurer to borrow, if, if one fund doesn't have enough money, you basically could borrow from another fund the treasury has. And so the interfund borrowing uh, provision will be important given what's going on in the ed fund. And we're, what this change would do would allow her just for this year to start using it if she needs to earlier, like um, in the, uh, I think it's in May, so or May 15th. So the idea is she'd want it pass in April so she can sort of get that, um, in use, and we'll, we'll go into that um, a little bit later. Uh, the other thing I just want to flag, and this is just sort of a, uh, a larger context thing, I'm talking to other states, and one thing to remember about Vermont, we talk about this a fair amount, that Vermont's a pretty unique state in that we're a very um, 
powerful legislature. You know, many seven, all but seven states have line item vetoes, uh, which means the governor has a lot more power over what comes out in the bills. Uh, Vermont's one of those states that does not, um, which is uh, fairly strong. And what you can see when you talk about um, relief situations and issues like this, the same type of thing happens um, in how states can re respond to disasters that go to pandemics. I mean, New Hampshire, once the emergency declaration is made, um, the governor can accept funds and spend funds and has quite a bit of authority beyond um, uh, to change laws and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility there. Maryland, the governor can use federal funds that haven't been appropriated. And um, they also have the authority normally to do a budget adjustment and to give the, the legislature the right to, some committees the right to review it, but not to stop it. And um, generally it's sort of like our rules committee that if a legislature reviews it and says, we, we don't like this, sometimes he'll back off, but that's within his authority. And so they think that with the state of emergency, they may just waive that whole process and the governor has flexibility there. Um, Tennessee has a similar thing where what they do is the governor can spend money um, when the legislature is not in session with the agreement of the two finance chairs. So in all those cases, they have uh, uh, authority to um, go beyond uh, what we do in our box. And just one more, I, New Jersey has just, it sounds like they're gonna do this. They're, they're, because of this whole end of the year problem, they're talking about changing their fiscal year end and maybe extending the fiscal year another three months or so. And then um, it's very complex and you know it, it's got a lot of issues because then it means the following fiscal year is supposed to be a full year. And so it's, it's not an easy fix and I'm not sure it's a great fix. I've talked to a number of other states and most of them are doing on the appropriation side a, um, a smaller budget, whether it's a three month budget or uh, whether they're doing a, a stripped down budget bill, which the knowledge that they'll um, have to come back and do more. And part of the thinking there, and I think as Graham mentioned in uh, our revenues, because of all the sort of information not showing up until probably end of July, it's gonna be really hard to understand what's happening in 21 in a you know, big way until after July, until um, August. and. So part of the thinking is, do we do something to bridge this fiscal year change gap and give us money in FY21? Um, and then do we um, uh, you know, make our big decisions at that point? Uh, edu education fund, just to flag that is different. You, know, you guys have to take an action now that's gonna affect the uh, education fund for the whole year. So whatever effort that's made on the general fund and pieces like that, we'll, we'll have to incorporate some, some differences. The education fund's an example, the fact that the transportation fund and in a normal year and the parks department would spend more money in the summer. Those are areas where we probably have to adjust whatever bill we do to uh, meet those needs. Uh, there's a lot of ifs and I just wanna, maybe what I thought I'd do is, um, and maybe while Teresa's putting up that um, chart about uh, cash, Availability. Answer the two questions that came up. Um, thing. There's no been no effort uh, to try to get a delay in any of our bond payments. I mean, basically everything the treasurer uh, has thought about is just, you know, we can continue to pay our bills. We can do it, and that the, and we can meet our all of our obligations. And that's pretty important. I mean, part of this is doing this in a way that Wall Street doesn't feel we're. Um, uh, um, playing too much in their their world and doing something that's just you know it's funny I, we, I, we fill out this form and they they look at budget tricks you know does the state do any is it transparent is it doing any budget tricks? this is a year where anything the states are all gonna I don't know how they're gonna rate us next year because there's no state that's not gonna be able to get through this without doing something different and the other question I think Representative Beck pointed out um, at this point we're not looking at uh, short-term borrowing on the state level uh, partially because of um, the sheet, which I'm hoping, um, Teresa, can you get up the uh, cash flow sheet? The one, <clears throat> it's up, Steve. Do you see it? Is that the one you wanted? Yeah, I don't see it, but I'm, if it's up, that's great. I can talk about it if it's invisible to me. How do I, <laughs> oh, well, I just see myself. That's all I see. I wonder if I've done something wrong. Yeah. Uh, let me, um, uh, hold on a minute. 
Okay, I see it. I'm sorry. Okay, so you need to roll it up because uh, I mean, roll it, go to the top because what this is a um, picture of our cash flow through uh, Monday, I guess it is. And so what we this is a tracking of every year of our monthly cash flow position. You can see as of Monday we had um, 374 million dollars in cash, and part of this is because. We keep pretty strong reserves, and we're probably among the states in one of the, you know, I don't know whether what quartile we're in, probably the top quartile of just having reserves on hand. We've got lots of sources, and it shows up in that 374. Normally, what happens in normal year is April with a big income tax payment uh, is an up, and then you pay out the money to the schools. It goes down, you know, it, it just doesn't keep going up, and then June you get your last your quarterly payment. So. Uh, you know, the question here is, on the one hand, we're the highest we've been in any fiscal year. I mean, three, 374 compared to 340 last year, you can see, in past years, it's gone, it was lower. Um, this is really, if we do allow interfund borrowing, this will be our, our ball work. And what she does is she looks at every um, fund and takes all the revenue estimates that we create and sees how close she gets to zero. And as long as she's above zero with a little bit of a cushion, she, um, uh, there's a treasure up here. She can then say, you know, we can probably survive that, uh, that, that period of time. And because we are looking at some of this money coming back in July, you know, and it's so on a short, this is one of the things that we think about. So last time when I first heard about this education fund down, I was sort of like um, a little Crazed, and then um, I think that as I, you know, I, I sort of talked a little bit with Beth this morning about it and things like this. And I, we do have this cash flow piece that is a little bit better than than and maybe enough. Um, I talked to Adam about this too. The other wild card we have is in our, uh, you know, we're going to be receiving 1.25 billion, and we have, you know, I asked. We talked about the idea. Well, that's really going to be in our cash. Does the interfund borrowing let us borrow against that to get through the fiscal year? And again, it creates a tremendous resource for us. And there's uh, several questions that come up that we don't really ask Washington. And that's one. You know, there's another one is what happens to the interest? Because the way the law is written, the, and it's not a big money, but it, it's, you know, a million or two or three, we could get an interest on this fund. What happens with that? And it's those are the type of things that we, you know, I've talked about with people here. I am probably talking to YouTube and, um, but, um, you know, we don't, it's not a question that they want to pose to the treasury about these things because, you know, we don't want answer or get what's in this guidelines that they're developing between now and the, the um, uh, 12th or so or after Easter when they're going to issue them. But there are a lot of unknowns and, and you know, those are, are several of them. So I don't know if I want to, I guess I would stop there and see if I've miss the target or whether there's things, there are questions or where you want me to go? Yeah. Steve, um, this is Janet. I have a question. Um, so I, I think I heard you say that when you first looked at the Ed Fund it, figures, you were, I think you used the word crazed and then you- yeah. um, <laughs> well, It's just a big drop. Yeah, and, it's, and I do worry about uh, this is not, right. you know, the concern here is, you yeah. know, once yeah. you have, sorry, go ahead. I, I just, so, but then you said you looked at this cash flow, you know, sheet, and that made you feel better. Um, but we've got the Ed Fund issue is more than a cash flow issue, I think. So, can you yeah. link those well, things for me? Yeah. So, so there's two things that run through my mind. And, you know, obviously you're, you're right. I mean, in all these things, it's how do we get through the fiscal year? And then what do we do with the larger term? And, mm -hmm. you know, clearly the larger term issue for all funds, whether it's the Ed Fund, the General Fund, the T Fund, the, uh, the strong possibility I think Graham had on his sheet is there's, we're going to be lower. We're going to have a real problem. So I'm just trying to compartmentalize and say, first goal is to get through the fiscal year. Um, the larger term piece, uh, we have to think about that. And you know, part of what I'm hoping, you know, obviously um, there's got to be a lot of discussions. We have a, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I, it's part of this building the 21. You know, do we build a on the general fund side? Do we build a short-term budget to just get get us started? Uh, there's so much we don't know, and I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is there's a ton of ideas, ton of approaches to year the next year, even though we don't know how much we're starting to build those. But I guess I was reacting to my immediate concern of getting through this year. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, David has a question. Dave. 
Uh, so Steve, um, so there's positive cash flow. And if we use it with the interfund borrowing to help solve our problems, um, our liabilities um, are bigger than our available cash, however. So do we end the year in deficit and are we allowed to do that on an accrual basis? So, so this is not a cash flow, this is a balance sheet. This is sort of like what we have in the bank. And so the question really is, do we spend every, you know, given, you're right, on, for this month, we, we're gonna, what Beth will do is she'll look at all the money going out between now and the end of um, June. And then she looks at how much she has in the bank. And then she says, and how much do we expect to come in? And you mix from all funds. We mix that together and we say, do we have enough to not go out to the short-term market? And that's what this is about. That basically, uh, and this you could have her come in and talk about this. There, her evaluation of this is that we are still a little above the um, the, the point where we go negative on cash overall. We're still in the positive territory. Uh, the issue that um, the chair raised is, the, and the issue you're raising is. This is not a, a situation that goes beyond June 30th. Once you hit June 30th, once the next year's projections and numbers come in, you know we we will have burned through our, our cash. We will have a situation where it's unclear if revenues keep up with expenses. Steve, but we haven't built them. I just want to jump in for a minute. So yeah. what what basically you've said is there is a probably, and I'm going to use probably, a path forward to close out fiscal year uh, 20. But when once we hit fiscal year 21, we've got problems in every single fund, whether we see, we we understand clearly the Ed Fund, but the general fund's going to be yeah. uh, in, in very desperate straits, as well as uh, pressure on the, the transportation fund. So we can use these dollars and these reserves that we've built up to to close out and make 20 happen in in a hopefully in a balanced way but once we hit 21 that's why we're going to have to move slowly with maybe a three-month budget because we don't even have a forecast to work off from yeah and it also makes for the ed fund the difficulty of figuring out what the yield is because you know it'll be uh, a problem in 21 you just don't know how big a problem and uh you know how do you set a yield because in that case, you don't have the option of doing three months um, in an environment where the information is just really not there. And just to go back to the one other question you asked is um, the balanced budget question. Vermont does not have a law or a constitutional provision that requires a balanced budget. We have had balanced budgets. I think there was one time in history, where, and I, I've just heard this, I don't know if it's a fact, where we didn't, but the unique thing is we, I think this was during the, um, uh, 91 maybe, and the, but what happened was the administration um, had a plan to, to remedy it. It wasn't the case of just, just we're out of balance. It was a case of we're out of balance, but there's a strategic, there's a whole plan about revenue changes, things like this. So it was, you could go to Wall Street and say, yep, one year it's gonna be bad, but this is how it's gonna be remedied. And people could um, take that and it gives you some sort of a, um, a just different story than the situation now where we probably, um, if we don't have a balanced budget and we don't know what the situation is and we don't have a plan, it's a little less pretty. Right. Uh, Peter has a question. Peter. So Steve, thank you. I just unmuted myself. Okay. Does this, the, does the balance sheet include the reserves, the stabilization reserve, the right. rainy day fund, the human services caseload reserve and the 27 53rd week reserve? It includes every bit of dollars in the state, yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I figured. Just checking. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly? Um, we don't have any assumptions in these numbers yet about rescissions. Is that correct? Correct. This is based on current outflow in FY20. And so this is this is based on, well, no, I think of that. These numbers are really just cash that's going on your screen. It has nothing to do with spending. So what she does in her analysis is she says, here's our cash position. Here's what we know about budgeted amounts. And, and she can she does sensitivity analysis. She might say, if, you know, what do we, how do we cover Tom Kovett's revenue changes? Um, she can say, you know, after all the stuff is in, we have whatever, 50 million left, pick a number. And then, then we can sort of also say, if we reduce spending, that sort of means that you have, you're using less of the capital. So 
you're correct. This does not, this is just a picture of where she expects the balance to be, or where it's been through March with three gaps in April, May, and June. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Steve? Uh, Steve, did you have more you wanted to cover for nope. us? I mean, I, I could yep. go anywhere else. Just that this is a lot of the things you're asking are things that are going to have to be resolved. And, you know, like when do we do a budget, timing of things, and that's fine. So uh, um, uh, if we solve fiscal 20 ed fund issues, um, and I, I confess to not really understanding the budgeting side of this, but by using um, this cash flow, uh, cash position, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, how does that get paid back? And what kind of problems does that create for us in 21? Well, so you're right. And basically what it says, it says, and this, first of all, this is all very tenuous, but it just take, you take Mark's balance sheet. You're basically leaving that deficit in the bottom line. So your fund will have a negative balance, but like other funds with a negative balance, uh, it, you know, on a, when we move money around, we've covered it on a cash basis. But as far as your problem for FY21, it, it doesn't do anything to solve it. And a matter of fact, it lets you carry forward nothing and less than nothing. Less than nothing. So, so this, is, this is purely um, making sure that we can pay our bills, but it doesn't, yeah. um, it doesn't replenish the checking account. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, uh, any other any other thoughts questions anyone has? Hey Steve, yeah, this is Peter Fagan again. So I'm just trying to think through here the current and the future. Um, Folks that are, and this is the reason why we need people to apply for unemployment insurance, that's federally taxable, I know, given a 1099G when you file. Uh, is it state taxable as well? You know, I my understanding is it is, um, but I'm not going to be a, a, I think I better understand that question. It, Damien it, 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 Steve, it, it is. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So then, so given that, what part of, of our education property taxes are collected by individual property owners versus business property owners, which are still trying to work through uh, potential ways of keeping their businesses open and being able to pay the property tax? Yeah. And I probably would turn that back to Mark. He spent more time than I have on this. There's okay. a lot of issues. I mean, how much of the property taxes are escrowed? How much of it is... Um, our business is going to, yeah. and actually this morning I was talking to a, a business about or hearing about it where, where um, they are going to keep paying their workers because what's happened federally is they get money that can turn into a grant if they right. keep their workers on. Right. So the goal is to keep the workers on and, and defray, defer all their payments until right. later point. Yeah. Mark, so do you wanna, you're raising good problems. Mark, do you want to explain how those different components of the education tax work? Um, so mo most of the um, education property tax money that comes in is non-homestead property taxes. Um, I don't have the percentages in front of me, but... Um, okay. Well, most quite, implies a little over 50%, so... It's, it's, more, it's more than that. The, uh, the non-homestead the non property tax revenues coming in are $694 million, and the homestead tax is uh, 614 less the $168 million in property tax credit. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Peter. Peter. Peter Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, since the topic has come up, I have to um, make an observation. And it really is a question, I think, uh, both of um, Mark, Graham, and Steve, and it goes to the issue of uh, uh, uncollected trust taxes, uh, which obviously affects two funds, uh, Ed and the general fund. Uh, I guess we're in a situation where we have to guesstimate because uh, filing has been waived in addition to making payments. Well, my question is though, uh, amongst the um, um, array, of federal assistance to businesses, whether they be proprietorships or some other uh, form, uh, and refunds and uh, the individual checks 
that are soon to start being mailed. I don't hear that there's a policy uh, by at least two departments in the executive branch to make sure that uncollected but nevertheless owed trust taxes are uh, stand as uh, secured creditors, uh, if I may use the analogy. In other words, the state trust, uh, trust taxes that are uncollected or unpaid uh, are the first um, priority, if you will, from those uh, instruments of federal largesse. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions anyone has? Katie, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we um, close down? Uh, no, other than our committee will meet on Monday morning to do our training. Oh, um, good. I'm going to sign off and have another meeting. That's Sorry it. about that. Okay. Thanks. But, but, so, but thank you. I think this was really valuable, Janet, for both committees. Yeah. Their um, distresses and, and it's it's really going to be all of us working together, which is really difficult when our, we're not outside each other's doors. Exactly. Yeah, I miss the little the the little conversations, but this is uh, this is it's good that we can do this, um, and just really appreciate everybody um, sort of getting their minds around around the challenges. Um, the the thing we do best um, just isn't available to us, which is figuring out revenue. So. And we have no money to spend, but we have bills. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, we're going to have to figure out a resolution and um, we will. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, committee, uh, for ways and means, I'm not sure when we're going to get back together. So be checking your email. I need to work with the speaker's office in terms of timing. Um, so just stay tuned. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop the live stream now.